Hey, Trevor. How's it going? Hi, Mitch. Doing uh, good. First question, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Trevor Spencer, and I'm a record producer and engineer and a musician. And uh, today we're talking outside of your uh, private studio called Way Out. That's right. Um, after years of construction putting this place together, you finally started making records here in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've been working a lot longer than that. Before this space, you worked extensively at a studio called The Unknown in Anacortes, mm -hmm. I saw. Um, can you talk about why it was important for you to have a studio all to yourself here? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I loved working at The Unknown, uh, which is a studio that still exists, that is run by my friend Nick Wilbur, a uh, really, really beautiful old church in Anacortes. Uh, also shared uh, with Phil Elvram for a while too. And uh, I think mostly I just wanted to be closer to Seattle. And I also was uh, at the point where I wanted to be able to uh, just be working around my own schedule. Um, but I really loved that place and it was a really inspiring place to work uh, because before that I had only really worked in uh, commercial studios and uh, more DIY bedroom environments and that place was uh, the connection between both of those worlds where we had this really big space with all of this gear that we shared and uh, so we could do really big projects there and uh, but be able to do things on more of a DIY budget and I wanted to bring that same sort of idea just a little bit closer to Seattle uh, for me and the people that I uh, tended to work with and uh, but still be able to stay on indie budgets and not be uh, as much of a commercial studio but more of a private studio for the projects that I was working on and also for other engineers uh, and producers too there are there are, there have been a few other engineers and producers that have uh, worked here which has made me really happy it's really nice to be able to uh, let uh, some other people take the keys every once in a while um, the, uh, the, li the last uh, Great Grandpa record was done here um, with Mike Davis and Sam Rossin, which was really cool. And uh, there was a Megabog record that was worked on here uh, with my friend uh, Jeff Traeger, who also helped build the place. And uh, probably forgetting a couple other things, but... Um, yeah, well, I'm sure that's gratifying to have... Uh, yeah. And there's so many great studios around here, so to have people, like, you put a lot of work into building this space, yeah. and to have people like, that's the place I want to work at, that's got to feel good. Was there yeah. certain things, uh, well, whether it's the unknown or other studios you worked at, where you saw, oh, they have this piece of gear, or, mm. or did, did you have things as you were building this studio, I want to replicate that from this space and put it in here? Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the main things that I, I I was trying to definitely incorporate uh, a couple ideas between the commercial studio environment and um, a place like The Unknown, which was sort of this really great DIY version of a commercial studio. Um, uh, I sort of wanted to have my own place that was uh, another sort of DIY place but had some more of the workflow and the things that are built into the walls that commercial studios had so when I got this place there was no insulation or drywall and so I was able to put all the cabling and electrical into the walls beforehand and HVAC you know just creature comforts like heat and AC um, that at the time, at the unknown that I was there, uh, were less available. And now, I, I, I believe Nick has put in some heat and stuff too, which is super cool. Um, but I just wanted to be able to have the sort of connectivity of uh, a studio and be able to have a place that people could stay too, um, which I think was something that I got from my experience working at Bear Creek as an intern. They have a really large residence there and I certainly don't have that 
here, but I realized the importance of being in this in this place outside of Seattle um, and how valuable it would be to be able to have people stay here comfortably too. Um, so uh, yeah, I think all of those things and gear specifically, uh, I have it particularly bad with gear because I do a little bit of everything. So being a, a somebody who enjoys keyboards and synthesizers and um, drums and guitars and amps, I mean, I don't really know where to start. <laughs> but so I definitely have a little bit of everything. And uh, I have a 24 track tape machine because I like to record on tape and also uh, record on the computer. So, um, but yeah, that's a long version of mostly saying that I really wanted to have the creature comforts and the connectivity of a larger studio, but be able to, uh, do it myself. And as a tease for everyone listening, uh, we will get to see, uh, all, all this stuff that Trevor's <laughs> talking about here a little bit later. That's right. Uh, but before that, I want to talk about collaboration. You've worked with a lot of, uh, you have a lot of recurring relationships with, uh, art artists you work with. Mm -hmm. Um, there's several albums with Father John Misty, uh, Kyle Kraft, Valley Maker, Sky mm -hmm. uh, Shell Set from Fleet Foxes. Mm -hmm. I'm really liking that new record uh, cool. that came out recently, by nice. the way. Uh, which I read is the fifth record you guys have done together. Yeah, that's right. That's great. Um, as, as you build a bond and a trust with artists, I imagine it could be easy to get into a mindset like, oh, here's what we did last time. That worked mm -hmm. really well. Let's do that again. Yeah. Is there ever a concern about repeating yourself or not being inventive when you get into these mm. kind of recurring uh, collaborations? Uh, that's a great question. I, I find that even uh, with these sort of uh, reoccurring records with the same artists, um, uh, everything is always different. You know, there's so many different variables that go into making a recording. Um, so I think, you know, I think the, that onus is really a lot of times on the artist. Right. And, um, my, I see my job to be a really good helper and to, do whatever is needed um and usually at the direction of the person and sometimes i can help facilitate what that direction and help might be um i think a lot of times uh it ends up i think a lot like a lot of those uh artists that you mentioned they've all been in different spaces and um a lot of the more recent things being here has been really great because we've been able to do records in one space which is really nice and really a, a privilege to be able to do that um i like jumping around to other studios but just sort of having the feeling that you're making a record in one space and you build comfort in the space over the uh, entirety of the project is is really nice um, as far as the collaboration goes and the more artistic part of it, uh, maybe the, the, the musical quality of things, um, I think, uh, doing these sort of reoccurring projects definitely promotes more musical collaboration over time, being more comfortable with each other's musicality and also everybody's sort of just being better at what they do over time as we get older, which I think is just such a fun journey to go on. Um, like with my, my friend Austin, who is a uh, value maker and Amy Godwin. Um, it's, uh, that's just been one of the great privileges of my life to be able to, uh, work on, uh, now three records with them. The, the third being one that we recently finished here. That'll, uh, start to have songs coming out in the fall. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, such a culmination of things working on, on that record. Um, the same could be said for working on the record with Sky, but just to use the record with uh, Austin and Amy, for example, um, we were able to do everything in this space, which was really nice. Um, 
but we also, after working on a couple records together, realized the things that we could do together to be more prepared and be more comfortable in the process. So we did a lot more pre-production on the record and really um, spent a lot of time on the songs together before we actually started recording things. We had demo sessions and uh, what we referred to as round tables of just like sitting around a table with instruments and um, like everybody feeling comfortable with stuff and collaborating on like typical production things like oh maybe there should be a different chord here or it would be cool if there was a bridge or we all really like this line of this song maybe we can emphasize this part a little bit more um yeah you know those sort of things are uh are just so cool to be able to do and uh similarly with sky um you know i think that that's a unique our relationship is very unique um because of the level of comfort we have around each other. And uh, Sky's uh, record um, that uh, just came out a few weeks ago um, was his first more song-based solo record. And uh, that can be a kind of a scary thing for people to do. So I think our friendship uh, was able to facilitate breaking down a lot of the barriers of um, discomfort and anxiety that can come into the recording process and uh, allowed us to both be comfortable with spending a long time doing one thing because it's sort of new for everybody that's there. Yeah, it sounds like you really do enjoy that kind of helping an artist through that process. When mm-hmm. someone comes to work with you, would you would you rather they kind of come in with ideas like half finished? You mm-hmm. do have that experimentation or is it and I'm sure a lot of people also come in like, I know everything I want to do mm-hmm. and your job is just to execute that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's positives and negatives both, but you sounds like you might prefer the real experimentation and discovery in the studio. You know, I really like, I think I like both things equally. Mm-hmm. I am definitely um, a believer in sort of dualities and multiplicities of principles of recording and also enjoying and not enjoying certain things, but allowing those things to coexist together is something that I'm really comfortable with. Um, so I'm comfortable with somebody coming in and helping them finish their songs or uh, helping them finish their arrangements or maybe a band coming in being totally done and not really wanting to have any creative uh, feedback and um, being more of a engineer and uh or just a or a co-producer um i'm comfortable in a lot of different situations um i think it really just the comfort really i think comes from good communication when you're starting a project to sort of know what those boundaries are and it doesn't have to be a business meeting to figure it out um but uh yeah i think i've gotten better at having conversations with people to find out what people want too Right. Like, yeah, communication is real key there. Like it's, there is a fine line between being an engineer and being a producer. There's, mm-hmm. they share a lot of the same roles. And it's just, if you have a conversation up front, we're like, how honest do you want, do you want me to say, do a different vocal? Yeah. Cause there are things that you can do to get better sounds, but if it's right. you're directing the artist or if they're kind of taking responsibility, that's the important conversations to have. Yeah. Especially when you're working like, most records aren't made in a couple of days. You're working with people for a long time. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a really interesting thing to talk about. I first of all, I think that like what I was talking about with dualities and multiplicities, the title of producer is one of those things that inhabits that space. Well, too. It's funny, it means different things for like a producer and rapper hip hop means something different than what it means oh, yeah. for just kind of more of the indie world you work in yeah it's uh so even when you someone says i want you to produce it's like okay i don't know exactly what that means so let's talk yes. about it yeah you know um you know if we're talking about motown a producer would mean uh calling the takes writing arrangements uh choosing the musicians yeah um but it's it really can be anything. I think the, um, 
I think it comes down to decision making and being when you are labeling somebody as a producer, um, you are hoping that they are going to help you make decisions on some level. So I think as soon as you cross that line of being somebody who is doing something as simple as calling a take on a song, if a, if a band is performing and they need somebody to be able to tell them if something is finished, I think that that can be producing too, because you might end up with a different result creatively if that uh, feedback isn't there. And uh, I totally also respect um, artists and uh, the way that they want to credit people. Um, I always give that job to the artists. And sometimes there's, uh, hopefully there's a discussion about that. Um, but it's not so important to me. Um, what I am labeled as because I am mostly just here to help and to make records, but it is a really interesting conversation to have. And I think that maybe the producer title, uh, almost gets a little bit too much weight sometimes. There is a status to it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be something so much more simple. And I feel like people have a tendency to consider, uh, the producer as somebody who's above the artist or the band. And I just really don't feel like that's, uh, that's appropriate to the title most of the time. Uh, other engineers I've talked to, uh, I almost always hear them say they prefer making studio records as opposed to doing live sound. Is that true for mm. you as well? Yeah, I have an interesting relationship with <laughs> You've live done sound. A lot of it. Yeah, because I've done a lot of it, but I also, um, I also never intended to get into live sound. Uh, my introduction to doing live sound for the first time was uh, when I was a monitor engineer for Fleet Foxes uh, when they were touring uh, Helplessness Blues. And uh, that came about from me being an assistant engineer on that record and just developing a friendly relationship with them and being asked to do the job regardless of my experience level. Uh, which was pretty uh, baffling to me. And I think baffling to a lot of other people who were touring professionals in that group at first. But um, I was really excited for the opportunity. It came at a really uh, great time in my life. Um, uh, but I'm trying to, the your question was more about uh, whether I prefer live sound or studio well, it, engineering. I, 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 and you kind of answered it. I do want to yeah. talk about live sound, though, because, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, you were talking about that Fleet Foxes tour in a, yeah. a KXP interview I read. You right. did uh, maybe a couple months ago, that was mm -hmm. now. Um, yeah, where, where you said, like, on, you were kind of an assistant producer on that, and you weren't expecting to get asked to tour with them. So it's kind right. of a, a scary thing at first. Where I haven't done this before. Yeah. And that's a big commitment to do it. Were there any... Uh, yeah, what did you learn doing that first tour with them? Well, yeah, so I was only a studio engineer and only 20, I think 20, maybe even 19 doing uh, that record where I was an assistant engineer. And um, I, I learned everything that there was about live sound in a pretty short amount of time because... Uh, I had never done any sort of live sound before and I didn't even realize that uh, bands took engineers with them, especially to do monitors. I mean, I had never played a show with a monitor engineer, maybe one time. And I had been on tours in station wagons down the West Coast, um, but nothing of being in a bus and flying places. I mean, I could go on and on, but... Um, uh, it was a huge learning experience and really, um, it, I feel so lucky and privileged to have had that opportunity, um, not only for the sort of re technical refinement of my skills as an engineer, uh, which I found very valuable. Um, does that translate to studio records to you? Yeah. Think? Yeah. I think so. Um, absolutely. Um, I, 
I developed a really acute sense of frequency, um, meaning that uh, in the human range of hearing from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, if I heard a, a, a sine wave at a certain frequency, I could get close to pinpointing that frequency, which is a skill that you develop in live sound to prevent feedback from happening um, or from maybe cutting out unwanted frequencies. Um, so things like that and being able to, uh, I was on the same equipment more or less every day and um, learning how to use um, gates and compressors and processing on the same sort of sources every single night um, was huge in the development of my understanding of processes. And this is post-college for me too. And uh, I learned so much more in that experience, I think, that I did post-college and post-working uh, Bear Creek as an intern and a house engineer for a little bit. Um, uh, in that year, probably touring and in the consequent years of touring. Um, but, you know, that experience was really valuable for that, but also for traveling and being able to see the world and meet so many people that I would have never have been able to me uh, meet otherwise. Yeah, a lot of people, including myself, would be envious of that. And yeah, yeah. that's so cool. You had a great time doing those tours. And mm -hmm. yeah, afterwards, you, you did some touring with tennis and most famously a long stand with Father John Misty. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I do. I have a Father John Misty question. Sure. You're, yeah, you're friends with him. You spend a lot of time around him. Mm -hmm. uh, from the audience side, there's a lot of mystique around his like stage personality. Mm. Um, yeah, can you speak at all how much of Josh Tillman is in Father John Misty? <laughs> Um, you know, I think that, uh, like many artists, there is a lot of what is out there for somebody on stage and also a person that is behind, uh, all that in a private life too. Um, Absolutely. so I think there's, um, there's a confidence that I really admire with Josh uh, in his performing and just like musicianship that is, uh, I think really, uh, uh, obvious to a lot of people, uh, especially that see him live and like understand like, wow, he's hitting every single note. Um, and even when he was in Fleet Foxes too, of being behind the drum kit and singing harmonies at the same time. So I was always really blown away with his, uh, musician, musicianship, um, and uh, yeah, I feel really lucky to have been close with him for a number of years. And uh, I think he's funny on stage. Oh, he's or, hilarious. Or, yeah, or certain people think that he's funny. And uh, uh, we both like to joke together. And that has been, a uh, you know, one of the best parts of our relationship together is humor. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to say if you're working on any new music with him? Uh, I know he was in the studio last year with Jonathan Wilson. Yeah, so. I haven't worked on anything with him recently, um, but he's definitely, uh, I, I think it's apparent from the internet that he's working on, on things and occasionally he sends me snippets and it always sounds great. Nice. Well, we'll be excited to hear it. Yeah. Um, in preparing to talk with you, I came across a Spotify <laughs> playlist you mm. made uh, and helped me with the pronunciation, like sure. Tahua Dreaming? Oh, Ta Tahuya. Tahuya Dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> um, everyone can still find that on Trevor's Instagram, by the way. There's yeah. a link to it. <laughs> um, it's going to sound silly. I enjoyed going through that collection of songs. Oh, yeah. um, for a lot of people who've made music their profession, I, I know several people who, like, they just don't listen to music for pleasure mm. that much anymore. Either you just need breaks from doing it or for the for artists maybe they don't want to be influenced too much by what they're hearing so it made me happy to see that you still enjoy music in such a, a casual manner oh yeah um walk me through some of the choices you made mm. assembling that playlist do any particular songs mean anything to you oh and yeah if you need a refresher i uh yeah i have a list of the songs uh, oh yeah sure i'll there. take a look at it yeah well there, there's some cool things on there oh man <laughs> yeah yeah okay so well I made this playlist, um, well, first of all, some context to Huya, uh, this playlist that I made for anybody who wants to listen to it was there called- There are good songs on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was called uh, Tahuya Dreamin'. And uh, Tahuya is 
uh, the city where my family cabin is. And so I've spent a lot of time relaxing in there over the years and feeling good. And so it was sort of a, uh, title, an apt title, uh, for, um, a playlist of music that I wanted to make to feel good too, because especially, uh, in these times <laughs> it's, uh, I, I'm hard pressed to want to listen to music that uh, doesn't make me feel good. So I really just wanted to be able to make something that made me feel good and uh, maybe that would make other people feel good too. But some of these choices, I mean, I was really, uh, there was a lot of inspiration from the Stone's Throw record label and um, um, some playlists that they had. And there's a lot of house music in sort of 70s, 80s, disco inspired uh things and i've been sort of getting a little bit more into those genres lately and having a lot of interest that is like reflected in this um you know as simple as maybe something like carly simon's why or uh myron and uh e and j rocks do it disco uh there's a giorgio Moroder song in there and donna summer uh larry heard uh this uh, band Mr. Twin Sister with the track Echo Arms, which uh, has a seven inch with a, a couple B-sides on it that is just sounds amazing and it's just like so fantastic. Um, but a lot of kind of like long play sort of disco-y house it, music-ish. And I'm using those terms loosely because it's not really my forte, but I think that this playlist in some regards was me expressing my interest in that. Um, but you know, there's some indie rockers in here too. Um, Mount Uri, uh, with this, uh, one of my favorite singles of Phil's distorted symbols and, um, the late great Richard Swift's lady luck, um, which is just one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, a few little world music nods and, um, yeah. Finishing with uh, Marvin Gaye's Gotta Give It Up, which is uh, one of my favorite songs and one of my favorite artists of all time. So, yeah. Nice. Well, we're going to take a quick break and come back and, um, and talk with Trevor about uh, the music he writes and records, uh, his new project, Trey Michael. Cool. All right. I've done a lot of talking already. Uh, what? How about you just tell me, uh, what can you talk? Uh, tell me about Trey Michael? Uh well trey michael is um actually not just me as it may appear to sound which is totally understandable but my friend uh, sam peterson and i and um uh, sam is one of my closest friends that i've been playing music with for a long time and uh i just love him we were roommates for a long time and um it's really just a way for us to uh, collaborate. We were just talking about how the project for us is maybe sort of between a solo project and a real band because we both bring ideas to the table. Um, and it's an interesting collaboration with, uh, with just two people cause we kind of do everything. Um, we have some other music that uh, has other people on it too, which uh, I think we're excited to share in the future. And uh, yeah, just been wonderful to put out some music with Sam because uh, we have such a great time together and have a lot of uh, love and respect and uh, just have a great friendship. And I am a huge fan of Sam's musical abilities. Uh, he's just such a awesome musician and i am so lucky to be able to play music with him yeah well uh, when you put out the two singles you have out so far um and you mentioned in an instagram post saying these are the first songs i've written and released in at least 10 years mm -hmm. it's exciting um what took you so long to get back into this creative headspace obviously you were busy doing other projects yeah. but I, I imagine you were doing some writing in that time still yeah for sure uh i definitely have been writing songs for a while when I was younger, uh, in my, when I was like in college, I definitely had bands and wrote songs and, uh, played singing and 
playing guitar with a band. Um, but I definitely, um, and I think still am really interested in making records with other people. And I, I also spent a lot of time at my, uh, my glorified day job of, uh, touring, uh, for a lot of my twenties. And I didn't have a lot of time to put energy onto that. Uh, and I always wanted to have a little bit more time to do it. Um, and I never, I also don't really have the desire to be a solo artist really, especially like a solo singer songwriter. Um, and so it was always something that I wanted to do with Sam. And, uh, even like five or six years ago, we actually started writing some music and, uh, had started recording some of it at the unknown. Um, but time kind of got away from us and we never finished that project. It was really cool. And we had a couple other people in the band at that point, but, um, I was also changing physically and emotionally. And as you do, you know, you, become emotionally detached from songs. Um, if you let a year or two go by, it's hard to perform a vocal for a song that doesn't mean the same thing to you if you wrote it a couple years ago sometimes. I think that a lot of people deal with that difficulty. Um, and I also, uh, my voice had just changed. I wish I had written all those songs lower because I was like 25. Uh, when we started recording and I had probably started writing some of those songs when I was 23. So when we started recording them, I realized that I was really having to strain myself and it's kind of comical, but true that that was a big part of not finishing those songs. And, um, you know, I was also just really inspired by a lot of people that I was around. I was around like so many talented people at that point in my life. I really had the urge to, if I was going to put out music to really um, improve my musicality and uh, do something that I felt really good about, which is definitely a trap that you can fall into of the sort of anxiety of wanting to be a this sort of different presentable version of yourself or something. Uh, that I definitely help a lot of people stray away from and discourage people uh falling into that trap um but i definitely did a little bit you know it's a very human thing to do and uh i think it took a lot of time for me to get comfortable being in this role i was definitely self-conscious about being a producer an engineer and musician and uh maybe folks thinking that i would my music was representative of the thing that I wanted to do with other people, uh, in the studio, which is, um, not the case. And, um, I think it just took me a while to get over that paranoia, which was, I think really just paranoia. I think it's pretty obvious if you listen to records that I do, that a lot of what I do is pretty different. Um, and, uh, I like to do different things because I have a, I, the, I, it's a cliche thing for music lovers to say, but I do listen to a lot of different music and I like doing a lot of different things as a producer and an engineer. Well, about your bandmate, Sam, uh, mm -hmm. I was reading your KXP interview uh, that uh, you, you said he's a big component of you staying in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm glad you have someone grounding you here, but I would like your perspective on the music industry here. Mm -hmm. LA and New York have larger things you could do but is seattle specifically is there something lacking in the community here that mm. our city can improve on have you noticed things like seattle doesn't have x so mm. i have to go somewhere else to do that thing that's a really interesting question yeah it's an on the spot thing it, you may not have an answer for it but i am curious yeah no i i mean um it's interesting i was just listening to last night my friend uh dan bailey who is the drummer in Father John Misty and is also a remote drummer for lots of people. Um, he just started a new uh, podcast uh, that's like a drumming Q&A thing and he was talking about his career and uh, he gets a lot of questions from people about starting their career and something that he was talking about that I find really true is that um, uh, unfortunately, if you want to 
it's not it's not i mean there's uh there's different shades of this but if you want to work in the music industry at large a lot of times it makes more sense to be around a community of of uh of people uh that are doing the same sort of things so being in a place like seattle or portland or la or new york uh maybe denver or austin nashville uh, those cities, I'm probably excluding some, I'll just stick to the U.S., but um, like those sort of cities make a lot of sense for musicians to be in and uh, maybe aspiring engineers or producers too um, because there's a lot of people doing the thing there and uh, a lot of touring that's coming through there and a lot of opportunities to meet people. Um, so I think there's a truism about um, needing to be close to uh, a city um, uh, for a certain kind of work. I also, being somebody who came from more of a DIY background before I uh, uh, started touring pretty much, um, I really respect people who do things by themselves in small towns. And I, you can see a lot of success and stories of people doing that. I think that's a really amazing and I love the idea of um, being in small towns um, or outside of you know a larger city you know here where I am I'm a stone's throw from Seattle and that makes a lot of sense to me um, but uh, as far as something that I don't think that uh, Seattle is missing anything I think that there's a lot of things that are being done to Seattle, unfortunately, that are outside of the control of musicians and artists that are that are making it hard for people to succeed. Um, there's a lot more financial pressure every day just because things get more expensive. There's so much more big industry here that is obviously pushing people out and it's really sad. I could never have had a place like I have in Seattle. I certainly looked for it. Um, but that's just too expensive. And um, it's unfortunate that places like Capitol Hill are losing their ability to be a cultural hub because the people that are um, on stage at the venues there um, aren't living in those communities anymore. So um, I think it's sad to see that happening. Um, but there's also such a connectivity of people online, um, too, which I think is worth something. I definitely have warmed up to the idea of people connecting uh, that way over the years. Um, but I don't think that uh, Seattle is missing anything. I think one thing that I've always felt about Seattle that is really cool and special is that there, there still are a lot of people here doing really great things and a lot of talented people. And there always seems to be room for somebody to really shine through. So there's, there always seems to be the space available for your project to really get its time in the light because uh, there, the city is just of this size where there's not uh, a ton of like huge bands that live here and uh, maybe a really um, overcrowded pool of people so you can do things we have a lot of really great resources too. having kxp so close is really awesome um, and a lot of like community organizations um, and maybe a little bit of a smaller city than say a place like uh, Los Angeles to make that happen. And I love uh, Los Angeles and New York too. I definitely have considered moving there um, in the past, but um, you know, things like uh, my friend Sam keep me here, my friendships, my family, and um, uh, the quietness that I think I'm afforded and the ability to have a place like um, I have obviously I can't have it in Seattle, but I can have it pretty close. I yeah, I think that's very well said. Even me, just as a transplant who's been here a little over six years, mm -hmm. that that's all hidden true from my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in and around the city as well. 
Uh, that's most of my big questions. Before we get to uh, the studio tour we're about to do, uh, sure. I have a quick funny thing to ask. Yeah. How weird is it that there's another Trevor Spencer who does pretty much mm. everything you do? You know who I'm, talk- who I'm talking about? I do, yeah. Yeah, there's... All right, so there's an Australian producer, songwriter, and he's a drummer primarily, yeah. just like you. Uh, there's even some mistake on allmusic.com where a lot of your production credits oh, get yeah. mixed in with his. Yeah, we're like, sure. like, oh, I did he actually play on these Olivia Newton John albums in the 70s? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, it is really funny to me, yeah. Yeah, has that proved any like issues for you where people. You know, like I was saying earlier, I don't really get super hung up on credits even though it's (laughs) valuable to display what you have done um uh it's mostly just funny to me yeah Yeah. that's a great way to look at it well we're going to be right back again uh and trevor's going to give us a quick uh tour of his studio sweet thank you all right we're in way out studio and trevor here is going to give uh us a tour yeah, so uh, this is the downstairs of the studio. Uh, this is the big room, and uh, there's a lot of uh, basic tracking that gets done down here. Um, obviously, we have a couple pianos and organs and um, a couple spaced out tables for eating these days. Um, there's a lot to look at, uh, but for starters, I just want to talk about what this place was. Uh, because when I got this place, it was a horse barn and required uh, quite a bit of construction to make it into what we are standing in right now, which is, um, I think, a really cool thing to reflect on. Um, and especially for uh, the people that come in here to sort of um, just like get that feeling of DIY energy and the building that took place. Um, so I built it mostly uh, by myself with my friends um, Mikey Ferrario and Jeff Treger, which um, are both um, maybe familiar names to some people in the music community, both musicians. Uh, Mikey in particular is um, does a lot of construction. He has his own framing business and is a very handy guy. Uh, so without them, uh, there would not be this place. So that's really um, important to me um, to share their work with people because um, it definitely was not just me. Um, but this was a horse barn and there was no insulation or drywall or lighting or uh, barely any electrical or working plumbing. Um, so you can imagine looking around this place, it looked quite a bit different. Uh, there used to be barn doors on uh, each side here, and also plastic flashing up above all the windows to let in light for the horses. So this place was very unsealed. So we had to do a lot of framing uh, and siding uh, to even just prepare it um, to have insulation, not to mention all of the uh, electrical work that had to be done. Uh, we ran at least a dozen new circuits with 80 outlets or so um, that was specifically made uh, for studio purposes. So a lot of different audio and appliance and control room, lighting, all those sort of things. Um, And it may seem kind of like a crazy project and it definitely was kind of a crazy project. It was a really big undertaking. I'm happy that I had the uh, spirit of uh, being slightly younger and just being so excited about something because I think I, it w- I would have been hard pressed to do this, the same thing now, just knowing how much work went into it. But I'm really glad that uh, I had that experience. Um, so learn a lot about all different kinds of construction and um, it's been really fun to use that in uh, expanding this uh, place. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of work done, obviously, to make this what it was. And uh, maybe I'll just share some other spaces of the studio and some things. Um, just pieces of gear that get used a lot. Uh, this will be a lot for the nerds, I think. So if you are- We're ready for it, yeah. Yeah, if you're not <laughs> interested in this, um, it, you might doze off a little bit, but I think that a lot of people that are interested in these sort of things find enjoyment in talking about gear and what have you. So um, this is uh, my son's 2000S bass amp. 
Um, and uh, 215 that has uh, JBL V140s in it. Um, that's really getting in the weeds of nerdiness with models and numbers. But this is a, a piece of gear that gets used a lot on um, sessions that I've had for a really long time. It's very reliable. It's been accidentally left on for um, a couple days at a time before and um, uh, not put up any fuss. So I have a lot of respect for uh, the craftsmanship of this amp, which was made in Oregon. Um, a really huge bass drum that I bought from a trading musician in Seattle uh, with one of my first paychecks from touring. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. It barely gets used, but it's really great to look at. And uh, a couple great Hammond organs. Uh, this is my little Hammond M3 that has been rebuilt. That sounds quite good. And a much more special uh, Hammond A100 that is owned by my friend uh, Casey Westcott uh, from Fleet Foxes that has everything that you would want out of uh, a Hammond. And uh, I think one thing that people don't uh, think about with Hammonds very much, obviously there's a Leslie next to it, but is how good the Leslie cabinets can sound sometimes just coming out of the speakers. And this is just a really phenomenal piece of gear and a really inspiring instrument and it looks cool. Um, so while we're over in this place, I'll walk you into the lounge of the studio, which is also uh, sometimes the apartment for people that are staying here. Um, so just a nice little cozy place. Uh, another thing of note is uh, there is heating and air conditioning everywhere, which is something that I feel proud of, of uh, another project that we had to do to make this space comfortable. Um, my dad and my uh, stepmom very graciously uh, lent their support for a couple weeks while we tooled away at that project and watched YouTube videos. Um, uh, so it was definitely a family affair as, as well as being friends. and. This room is also wired in um, to be used as an ISO booth, so a lot of times uh, amps will be in here or in the bathroom um, under the sleeping loft, um, which can also be used as another isolation room as well as a place to shower and stuff too. So it's definitely a, a really cozy place to hang out and to stay for a while. Um, and so going a little bit deeper into the studio, um, these pianos are uh, both uh, special in their own ways. This is a, I, I actually don't really know how old this is, but it is quite old. Um, this Stroud player piano that has been gutted. So at one time this had wheels and you would crank it and it would uh, play. Um, so it's a quite a deep um, upright piano, which is cool. Um, has kind of a bigger sound. Uh, and this is another, um, a piece that's owned by my friend Casey Westcott um, from Fleet Foxes. This is a Chalen upright piano, which is a really special piano um, to me personally, uh, because uh, when I was touring with Fleet Foxes, uh, we actually toured with this piano. And I had to help get this thing up on stages. And then it was just like one of the hardest things to do. Fairly backbreaking, but I love Casey quite a bit, and um, being naive and from the studio world, I just figured that if you had a piano in your band and you were of a certain size, you probably just used a piano, not knowing that that was actually pretty uncommon. And this piano is really special because this is uh, uh, from the UK. Uh, I believe Casey had it shipped from the UK um, because uh, if you read a lot about Abbey Road Studios and um, uh, different records that were made there, a lot of times you'll find that uh, channels were used. And um, that's kind of what he was after. And uh, it's just a really cool little piece. You can see it's like kind of worn out. It has some strip stripping on the wood from like gaff tape of like some crew person who must have um, put tape over it to like finish it down. So it's really funny that it's just, this beautiful thing has like been on the road, but it's just like, it sounds amazing. Um, and then back here is uh, a sort of a, a space, this corner space in the studio that gets used a lot for drums and sometimes for vocals when we do vocals um, downstairs or for a songwriter. Um, a couple different 
style of uh, baffles that uh, we have in the studio. Uh, one that has a window and one that is just a, a softer wall. Um, both really useful and um, a big stack of drums and other stuff, uh, more of which is upstairs, but um, old Gretsch run badge and Ludwig stuff, a couple wood snares and uh, other um, kind of standard things like superphonics and the like up there. Um, but we can go upstairs and check that out. Uh, so the upstairs of the studio was uh, the hayloft of the barn. So this staircase didn't even exist when uh, this place was originally acquired, which is pretty wild. But um, another uh, friend of mine, Tyler Jones, who's another Anacortes musician that some people might recognize, um, also a really um, uh, great um, wood worker and craftsman and just super talented guy was sort of, I sort of was like, I just want to have a staircase that's this wide so we can carry big things up here and we cut a hole in the floor and we built a staircase. Um, this is definitely one of my favorite places in the studio. Um, it just has a really cozy feeling. Um, and there was a lot of TLC put into the treatment of the space. And um, I really wanted to be able to have a space that was a little bit more dead, but also be open to the rest of the space too, to be able to get room sounds out of things that you might be recording up here. You can see over there the control room, which we'll get into in a moment, um, is just right off of this room. And um, this room gets used for a variety of things, a lot of times for vocals. As you can see here, I have a drum set set up up here. It's also one of my favorite places to record drums because it has sort of more of a resonant wood floor. And um, it can be more dead. There's a lot of treatment up here um, and also curtains that can close the space off, off a little bit more, which are handy for if you're recording guitars up here and you have drums uh, downstairs or something with a band. It's a uh, nice space to isolate a little bit of uh, stuff with. Um, so that's where there's a lot of guitar amps and things up here too. Good selection of old fenders and um, other fun things. Um, uh, this drum kit in particular has uh, always been really important to me. If uh, people have recorded with me in the past, they might know this drum kit because it gets used on about 90% of what happens um, on my recordings because it's just a really special kit. Um, one thing that I did on the Fleet Foxes tours was set up the drum kit and tune the kit and buy heads for um, Josh really just out of necessity because nobody else did it and uh, shortly after that tour he moved to LA and uh, gifted me um, this kit and uh, the Gretsch um, downstairs and that was really the most probably one of the most if not the most generous uh, gifts that I've ever received from anybody because being a drummer and uh, somebody who does a lot of work in the studio um, this really got used a lot so that was very kind of him and uh, they have gotten used so much, um, and I love playing drums. So I, a lot of times if I'm mixing a record, when I'm taking breaks, um, I'm playing drums, which is another great thing about having this space is that it's also sort of a really great place for me to practice and work on things. Um, but um, yeah, drums uh, and a few keyboards. Um, a Juno 6, which um, I love and most people are familiar with. This one has MIDI, which is really cool. Um, I, this is sort of a funny area to me because I feel <laughs> like this is like really standard like indie rock fair right now. We have the Maltron with the Arturia and the Moog Minotaur. Um, very like standard issue, but all like really super useful stuff, which is kind of why it's sitting right outside of the control room because these are things that are super useful the polysynth, the monosynth, and uh, the Meltron get used quite a bit. 
Um, there's a lot of other fun things around, you know, tape echoes and weird preamps and cassette machines. And this is a locker that I built for other gear. Under this is a Krumar orchestrator, which is a really cool piece. Lap steel. And um, then we have uh, the control room, which is also another really special purpose-built space which was one of the great things about being able to design this place um, with really just the skeleton. So um, we always wanted to have the control room upstairs. It just felt like we were going to be able to build an enclosed space um, in sort of a unique way with a vaulted ceiling. Um, we definitely could have made it downstairs. Um, and there was a couple places that we considered putting it, but um, there was something that just felt right about having it up here. You know, there's definitely advantages to having the control room down where a little bit more of the action is happening, but so much just happens right out the other side of this door, especially when you're getting into overdubs on a record, or if you're just working on a record with one or two other people, so much just happens right there. Um, so it has a really unique feel and um, there is a window that looks out in this place. So if that's your thing, that's cool. I never was really somebody um, who found a lot of value in the window in a studio looking out onto the big room. There is definitely some obvious value of being able to see things that are happening. Um, but I think also from working with a lot of new artists, I, I always felt like people felt really uncomfortable by the window and you being able to see right out there. And um, I just realized that that wasn't a priority to me. And um, so here we are upstairs in the hayloft of the studio. And um, uh, we just have a, a view out onto the pasture that is um, just kind of across from the, uh, the driveway here. Um, which might be a little bit hard to see from here, but it's a really nice place to sit and work because you're really just kind of looking out onto this pasture that you might see a dog running across or something like that. And it's, um, it, just, uh, it just feels good in here. Um, there's a lot of light and um, a lot of good airflow. And um, I've just really enjoyed working in this space because I, we built it to be a particular way. It's double walled um, in the floor and in all the uh, surrounding walls. Um, so it is pretty isolated from the rest of the studio. There, there hasn't been any issues with that, which has uh, been really great. And um, the dimensions of it work really well for listening to music, um, just sort of scientifically based on the sort of rules of monitor placement and stuff like that. It's a really great place to mix records which I do quite a bit of, and it was a really big priority uh, for me designing this space to make sure to have a really nice purpose-built space for that. Um, so uh, it's been a great place to listen to music. Um, uh, we have um, this console, the M1000, which is sort of a unique piece. Like a lot of um, sort of 70s consoles, it has its um, particularities some things that are always kind of being worked on. Um, but uh, it has a really great sound and uh, has had a lot of custom work done onto it uh, to improve the sonics of it. Um, uh, there's sort of some unique speakers here that you don't see a lot in uh, commercial studios these days. These are uh, uh, Tannoy ML10s that are uh, modded by Manly. Um, and they are just really fantastic sounding speakers, very true. And um, I think the space and these speakers in particular um, really lend themselves to a very uh, true listening experience. And if something sounds the way it does, if something sounds good here, a lot of times it's going to sound the same in your car or somewhere else, which I feel really proud of. And. Uh, uh, I think that the, the, the true listening environment can be sort of shocking to people sometimes. Um, but it, uh, it seems, uh, everybody seems to, uh, other engineers and producers seem to uh, really enjoy it afterwards. Um, and uh, we can kind of sneak around here. If we're talking about the sort of building of the studio, 
all of the cabling terminates and actually comes out behind this rack here. So there are many channels of audio that are coming out uh, of the wall there that are being linked up into the patch bay. And uh, like we were talking about before, uh, one of the things that I was really excited about of building a place was being able to have the sort of connectivity everywhere. So uh, there are really uh, accessible places to plug in microphones and uh, headphones everywhere in the studio um, with quite with with quite a bit of ease, um, which is just a really nice thing to have, uh, like you find in a commercial studio. And uh, we were able to put that in, in our sort of like elevated uh, DIY space here. Um, and uh, have the Studer um, 827, uh, which used to be owned by Matt Bailey's at uh, Red Room uh, Studio. Um, really great uh, producer engineer that some uh, other uh, Seattle folks might be um, familiar with. But, uh, it's interesting, I used to only record to tape, and uh, I don't do it as much as I used to. I think a lot of times just because it uh, costs more money and it takes more time. But I use it a lot for mixing. I do a lot of bouncing tracks to it um, after things have been recorded in the computer. And uh, it's definitely the most expensive signal processing sort of thing that you, one of the more expensive signal processing things you could buy, but finds a lot of use that way and occasionally when it gets uh, used tracking it's also really fun and uh, I love using tape um, as much as I do uh, the computer and using them together. This is a very hybrid digital and analog setup. So yeah. Um, yeah well this is so cool. I'm, yeah. This is an incredible space. We were Thank talking you. earlier about um, like, yeah I guess for my last question like mm -hmm. Um, not every hobbyist musician or bedroom producer will be able to ha have the means to create a space like this. So for, for the nerds who are watching this and have made yeah. it this far, is, is there any kind of overarching piece of advice you can give people to kind of level up either their mixes or, yeah. or maybe affordable equipment that kind of like can really get you started to, uh, on your way to sure. a place like way out. I am uh, happy for anybody who wants to get in touch with me and talk about those sort of things. I, like a lot of other engineers and producers, I get a lot of questions from people that are starting about equipment. Um, I think my advice as far as that goes, I'll maybe sort of like spin that a, a little bit differently mm -hmm. is to, um, I think it is really important to have a space um, in uh, the way that, uh, records are made uh, now that is of your own that you can do some work in. Um, obviously right now during COVID, uh, that's like really important to people um, because everything, or not everything, but a lot of things are, more things are remote. Um, but just in general, to be able to have your space, uh, especially if you're an engineer or a producer, to be able to work on mixes and listen to things outside of maybe the commercial studio that you're doing the tracking of your record in is super valuable and uh, to be able to have the access to something. So that might be um, sort of basic knowledge to some, but I think is really important. And uh, I would say that uh, in that space, uh, probably the most important thing to me is to have a place that you can be comfortable in and a place that uh, you can listen to music in where it sounds sort of accurate. So I think uh, list, uh, improving the way that you are listening is going to um, foster the most success in uh, making your recordings sound good. That makes sense. Whatever space you're in, make the most of it acoustically and make it a vibe that's a good, that has a good creative energy and workflow yeah, to it. For sure, yeah. Speakers and... Um, maybe light acoustic treatment and um, like a comfortable place to sit. <laughs> I think it's like really important. Well, Trevor, this was so much fun. Thanks yeah. for being on show and tell today. Last words, yours. Uh, where can people get in touch with you? Where can they hear their work? Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, there's more information about the studio and the construction. If you're interested about that kind of stuff uh, on my website, which is trevorspencer.biz. 
and you can see other projects that I've worked on and find my email address to get in touch there. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Mitch. It was great talking to you. Yeah, you too. Later, everyone. Bye.